Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship on this beautiful, beautiful day. We are glad that you are here to worship with us, and we are grateful that Bishop Amy Current is here as our guest today. She is the Bishop of the Southeastern Iowa Synod, and uh, she'll be bringing us the message today. Afterwards, we're going to have fellowship, and the uh, Women of Joy, as Kathy announced a couple weeks ago, have ended their pie ministry, but they saved out a few for us to enjoy today for fellowship. And we give thanks for that ministry that has um, done many wonderful things over the years and has raised money that has been given to support various ministries that, that we have been able to do. Um, we've been praying in our prayers for baby Everett. Um, he's my sister-in-law's great-great-nephew, and uh, he died on Friday, so um, I just want, want you to know that when I'm reading his name in the saints and lift up his family in prayer, and if we can continue to pray for the family, I thank you for your prayers. Um, also, Linda Holtz had um, successful bowel replacement um, on Thursday, but then she did have some ups and downs and didn't get home till late yesterday. But please continue to hold Linda Holtz in your prayer as well. We've been uh, having a stewardship emphasis on sharing the good news, and this week our emphasis is called is on stewarding our power. And we've been able to have a stewardship moment, and so Wiley Pillars is going to give us a um, speak to us as our stewardship moment today. Thank you, Wiley. Thank you, Pastor. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Several weeks ago, when Pastor uh, gave me this topic of power, and I agreed to do this, um, I don't think I realized, because I never thought about what power was really all about. And so I guess I want to talk to you this morning a little about, about my reflections on power. In the material, it says, it is not necessarily every day that you assess your position of power in the world. But every person has power, power to make choices, power to be present to God's love and presence in the world. And when I'm done, I'm gonna ask you if you've ever sat down and reflected, do you have power? Have you ever used your power? And how have you used your power? For me, this was a total reflection, on, quite frankly, on my entire life. And you say, well, why would that be? When I looked back, when I first thought about the word power, and I can now describe it, although I couldn't have two weeks ago, there's two kinds of power. There's human power, and there's divine power. And we tend to think in our lives about human power. And that's what I did. I went back and I reflected. I said, what's that mean? Have I ever exercised human power over people? You know what I did? For 20 years. For 20 years I was a prosecutor. For 18 of those years I was county attorney. As county attorney, I made the decision daily of what people got charged with. I made the decision daily of what happened in people's lives. 18-year-olds who might be charged with shoplifting or something simple. I made the decision, should they go to jail for a few days? Should they be fined? Oh, maybe we should just dismiss the charge and require they go into the military and learn what the rules of life are about. I made decisions much, much more serious than that. There are people in Fort Madison that are there because I sent them. But I didn't send them there out of retribution. I didn't send them there out of anger. So as I reflected back on the power that I had, and I never even thought as, as a prosecutor I had that power. I was young. It was a job. And as I thought back about the decisions that I made, I never, re I don't know one I regret making. And the reason because 
I really felt every decision I made was in that person's best interest or society's best interest. And I said, why is that? Interestingly enough, that drove me to about 20 years earlier in my life. And that first incident was an incident when I was in high school, I was probably a teenager, and I was coming home from work with my dad. It was a dark night. It was, it was December. And there was a homeless man. I mean, he was slobbering. It was, and dad stopped. He picked him up. And it's dark, and I'm saying, don't we have to get home? Mom's probably got dinner on the table. And he says, no, we need to do this. And he picked him up, and he took him to the restaurant. And he bought him dinner. And then I thought about my father buying a school bus for Bible school and driving that school bus for two weeks. My dad worked 16 dollars a day. I saw him at dinner, but he could drive a school bus. And then the crowning moment in, in really, I think, my life, and you're probably going to say this is silly, and it is, came at dinner time. Because the one time we all got together at home was dinner, with a tablecloth and a formal dinner. Good German family. Everybody ate, and they ate everything on their plate. And you ate what was served. You didn't get your choice of food, unlike some of my grandchildren. <laughs> <clears throat> but our dinners weren't normal dinners. <clears throat> they were conversations. They were educational. They were Wall Street Journal, politics, economics. And out of the clear blue sky, my father said to me, what do you want to be the rest of your life, Wiley? I had no doubt. I said, oh, Dad, I want to be a professional baseball player. <laughs> and you can imagine what kind of a laugh that got. He said, no, son. You're going to do something in your life to serve other people. It was that example, as I think back at those examples, where the core values of how we live our lives come from. That we think about service to our Lord, but we have to remember that the, that the lesson is that we walk in our Lord's sandals 24-7, 365 days a year, because the critical part of divine power is the example that our lives show to other people. Just to finish my little scenario, and this could go on, Pastor, for much longer. <laughs> you sometimes wonder what God, how, how, whoa, why did Pastor schedule me for this talk? So, several weeks ago, I'm, I'm watching a documentary. And it was on like four nights in a row in two hours. And it was about a man, who I'll tell you who he is, whose, whose life, professional life, was violent. But whose regular life was not violent. And when he died, this is at the end of the eight-hour uh, biography, they were interviewing his daughter and one of the questions that was asked, and I don't remember how it came out, but her response was, his favorite saying in life was that service to others is the rent that we pay for our home in heaven. And that struck me, struck me so much that I went and wrote it down. It, it, it quite frankly might even be the basis of how I came up with the story I'm telling you. That person was a person I actually met shook hands with, who was Muhammad Ali. But how true was the, is the definition, not just in Christianity, but whether you're a Muslim or anything, service to others, that is the divine power.
Thank you, Wiley, for that touching moment, <clears throat> for helping us to think more about our um, ability to steward our own power and how we use our power and service to others. I invite you to stand as we begin worship with our call to worship as printed in your bulletin. God's power is made known in serving on the cross for the world saved. Let us live out our love and faithful service. Is that printed in there, Paul? Yes. Yeah. So in the bold and um, I got God's words. Okay. I'll stand with you. How about God's abundance pours forth from the heavens, ensuring enough for all. Let, Let us live, live out our love and faithful service. For the sake of the hungry, the homeless, and the poor. Let, Let us live out our love and faithful stewardship. For God's gift poured out in loving care. Let, Let us live out our love and faithful stewardship. For disciples to generously follow and give. Let, Let us live out our love and faithful stewardship. Until all are fed and can truly live. Let, Let us live out our love and faithful stewardship. Our gathering song is number 659. We'll sing verses 1, 3, and 4. is from Isaiah chapter 53 verses 4 through 12. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that is before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was all was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, 
He shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him, the will of the Lord will prosper. Out of his anguish, he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressor, transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Let's read the psalm responsibly by verse, beginning with the refrain and repeating where indicated with the capital R. Psalm 91, verses 9 through 16. You have made the Lord your refuge and the most high your habitation. Because you have made the Lord your refuge and the most high your habitation, no evil will befall you, nor shall affliction come near your dwelling. For God will give the angels charge over you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will carry you up, unless you strike your foot against a stone. You have made the Lord your refuge and the most high your habitation. You will tread upon the lion, cub, and viper. You will trample down the lion and the serpent. I will deliver those who claim to me. I will uphold them because they know my name. They will call me, and I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble, and I will rescue and honor them. With long life will I satisfy them and show them my salvation. You have made the Lord your refuge, and the Most High your habitation. The second reading is from Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. Every high priest, chosen from among mortals, is put in charge of things pertaining to God on their behalf, to other gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is subject to weakness, and because of this he must sacrifice for his own sins, as well as for those of the people. And one who does not presume to take his dishonor, but takes it only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him having been designated by God, a high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And Jesus said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? They said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism that I baptize with? They replied, we are able. Then Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. 
When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, you know, those among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their leaders, lord it over them. And their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. Whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came to be served, not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Here we are. It's good to be with you. It was fun to drive up to Zion, Princeton. I had only known you before from Google Maps, <laughs> from um, looking at um, what I could find online, and from a lovely meeting I had now so many months ago, it seems. However, it might have just been a couple. But time is funny these days, right? Um, I was able to meet a few months ago with some of your leaders on Zoom and to hear a little bit about your ministry here at Zion. So it's good to be with you today in this place, to be at worship together, and to hear the word, to pray together, to um, listen to one another's concerns, and mostly to hear the word of God proclaimed so that we might be filled and renewed in grace so that we might share the love of God with others. I give my thanks to Pastor Dorman and all of you for inviting me to be with you today. As it was told, my name is Amy Current. I serve as your bishop. It's good to be with you. As of this weekend, I have officially been um, in this role for one year. And so um, happy one year anniversary to us as partners in ministry and um, as we continue to find our way in this time. It has been a crazy time to begin to get to know you. I've met your pastor for the first time this morning face to face um, as we have so many things that we are doing via Zoom and technology. And so it is, it is just a privilege to be able to be out and about I, I note, and I, and I appreciate your hospitality, we are still wearing masks. Um, I know that, that some congregations have discerned this in all kinds of ways, and I support you um, in the way that you have determined that, and I appreciate that you welcomed me with mine on. I'll put it on again um, when, I'm, when I'm close to you. We have children of staff in my office that are not old enough to be vaccinated yet, and we're trying to be really careful um, for their sake so that people can can stay healthy and so um, we have made this our policy as a staff so I want you to know that and appreciate your hospitality in that regard so here's the thing I bring you greetings from all those folks a couple of us are out and about today um, doing some preaching uh, there's four of us on staff myself and the three assistants that all get out and about and we will preach at all 136 uh, congregations and ministries within you know, the next year and a half or so. We've kind of plotted out as much as possible. We go where we're invited mostly, or if there's an occasion that we are able to be a part of. And so it's just simply a privilege to be among you. So I greet you not only on behalf of the Office of Bishop Staff, but from those other 136 congregations in our synod in which we are partners with and whom you pray for and uh, whom we should have the privilege of sharing the good news with here in southeastern Iowa. Uh, I really want to give you thanks for your ministry, for the ways in which you are involved in lifting up one another, um, in, in prayer from week to week, in kindness and love toward one another. I remember in our phone call or our Zoom call that we shared, um, the leaders described this community to be one of beautiful support for one another in community. Another thing that I heard in that conversation was a desire for outreach. 
how to invite and encourage more from within Princeton and around this area to join in ministry so that they might too share the, hear the good news of God. And so I've been celebrating with you. Great pumpkin festival. Pastor did give me a heads up, but I did also uh, remember that these, this fall festival was something that you celebrate together. All kinds of people that aren't here necessarily this morning, or maybe there are some newcomers this morning, um, were able to be here and to receive hospitality from your congregation with joy. That is sharing the good news. What I was sad about was the pavilion. I knew about this, I heard, I heard the excitement around it, and then another storm, right? And so I, I have grieved with your congregation and your community about that as, as you again are faced with what's next in ways to reach out in this community. I parked over there where I assume straight out on purpose because I wanted to take a look at that area that has avenues in from the community for you to reach out with God's love. I also want to give you thanks and, and uh, tell you how much your gifts are appreciated. The gifts of offering that you share week in, week out, those that support your local congregation and community in all the ways from the lights on to a called pastor, and that in which you share with the Synod so that we might share the good news together through partnerships, through support to Lutheran services in Iowa, to campus ministries, outdoor ministries, and the like. And then the portion that we send along to the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, so that we don't only make a difference with God's love in Princeton, in southeastern Iowa, but really throughout the entire world. The love of Jesus is shared through our church. So I thank you for your kindness and the way you steward your gifts. Not only your gifts of power through God's love, as we heard this morning, but also your gifts of um, giving and um, from your own resources. So thank you. Thank you for that. What a gift it is to be the church so that we might share. Now, you're probably thinking, right, that was it. She's done. That was her sermon. Sorry. It was just my greeting for this morning, um, but it's, I want you to know how, how good it is to be among you. I hope we have some time over pie to um, chat together, too. I'm eager to hear what you're thinking about, and I would love to hear your questions, and I understand there might be some time for that after worship, so, so I would love to engage that way. When... Um, when your brother in Christ, Wiley, started to speak today and was uh, talking about this concept of stewardship of power, knowing that I'm so delighted that your pastor and leadership have decided to use the resources that we provided for stewardship this month um, called Sharing the Good News, I kind of thought, well, good deal. That takes care of that gospel. Thanks for preaching. Um, that, was a, that was a beautiful, beautiful uh, personal testimony um, for you, um, for this community, and also for your family. So thank you for that. Because here's the deal. When I think about the gospel of Mark, I think what we, what we see there, the people that we meet in the gospel of Mark are humans. It's just a great gift. It's 16 short chapters, easy to read, heavy stuff, but what we meet on every single page is humanity, just like me and you, right? People that are trying to figure it out but trip over themselves every single day. They're well-meaning, they're trying to, to get this Jesus, but they just can't quite figure it out. And so here we are again, in Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, and we come face to face with the humanness of the disciples. This is right on the heels of Jesus telling the disciples for the third time, the third time that he is to be tried, that he's going to die, and that he will be resurrected. He's told them the third time. And do you know what James and John hear? James and John continue to hear that Jesus is the Messiah, right, that has come to live among them, and they are convinced that he is going to be the Messiah that comes in a blaze of glory and that is 
promoted to a place of honor and that there will be a, either a real or figurative throne where there will be two chairs to the right and to the left, right? No matter how many times Jesus is telling them about what is to come, they continue to believe that this Messiah is going to come through and make his way, right? But here's the deal. They've had 10 chapters worth of stories, right? So we all know this didn't unfold in chapters, but the journey has been full. And all along the way, Jesus has not been powering over. Jesus hasn't been a tyrant. Jesus hasn't been lording over. Instead, Jesus has been loving and healing and teaching and loving and teaching and healing all along the way. So James and John here are convinced that they want to be right there with Jesus at the end and to be recognized as belonging with this one. And Jesus says, guys, you do not know what you are asking. And you know what he says this, right? The only other place that I can find this week uh, in Mark's gospel where there is mention of somebody sitting at the right and the hand of Jesus is at the crucifixion. There, is, there are two criminals that hang to the right and left of Jesus when he gets to the cross. And then he says, can you drink the cup that I will drink? And here, Jesus is referring to his death. Will you be baptized with the baptized with which I was baptized? The baptism where Jesus was named and sent to be the savior of the world through his death and resurrection? They say, not knowing what they were asking, remember, you bet, we're able to do that. Yet we know Yet we know in the story that when push comes to shove, James and John and all the rest run away. This is real. This is real because we are humans. Just like James and John and all of the rest, we believe that we can, with our own power, do all of the right things that we can ask for what we want, that we can look really good for Jesus, right? But that in the end, we run away. Or, more typically, we turn inward on ourselves and forget that we're called to love one another and instead get caught up in our own selves. The story goes on because that was James and John and their conversation with Jesus. But guess what? The 10 disciples who were close behind, and we understand that there was a crowd even farther away that was simply afraid, we're told in Mark's gospel. But the other 10 are thinking, what in the world, James and John? You're in this together. There's 12 of us here. What are you thinking? And they begin to squabble. Squabble among themselves. Oh my goodness, people can be petty, right? <clears throat> I don't know about you, and this probably doesn't happen in your congregation or your community or your workplace or your school or your family, but sometimes people simply hear what other people are doing and begin to squabble with them, with one another, and frankly, Jesus is watching this and is, has had it, right? Here's all these disciples that I have given a call to to follow me so that they might fish for people. And here they are spending time squabbling. What about us, they think? Where do we fit? We want to be recognized. We want to have places of honor. And Jesus says to them, 
We are not called to places of honor. We are called to serve. It's one more reminder where Jesus turns the expectations upside down. Jesus isn't leading some kind of parade so that people will fall in line and begin to be a majestic, powerful parade that stomps on the others. But instead, Jesus is turning these folks out so that they may share more love with every person that they meet along the way. Jesus' expectations are for serving from the heart. Jesus desires for us to love one another. <clears throat> the world was already teeming with tyrants. The world is always teeming with those that want to lord it over or stomp on those that are other or beside or forgotten or voiceless or in need. Jesus calls us to stop, give a ride to the homeless person and make sure that they have a plate for dinner. Jesus invites us to make sure that we bring a meal to those who are grieved with death that has come way too close. Jesus calls us to create pie so that it can be sold, so that others in the world might receive from that bounty to help them to live and navigate in the world. Jesus reminds us that Jesus did not come into the world to be served, but to serve. And even more so, Jesus came into the world to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus on the cross took a means of death, a means of killing, a means of torture in his day and turned it into a gift of life. All people, every single creature that God has created is one for whom Christ died. <clears throat> and in the cross, Jesus gave his life to the world and didn't only teach us to serve one another. Jesus did not only teach us how to be kind to one another. Jesus didn't only teach us how to model after him and walk in his ways, but Jesus in the cross and through the resurrection transformed the entire world. Transformed it, turned it inside out, where God's reign is not one of power and glory and triumph over people or powers, but God's reign is in grace, in love, that sets us free from shame, from doubt, from jealousy, from pettiness, from greed, sets us free from everything that stands between us and God, sets us free to love, to love one another no matter what. Sets us free in baptism, where we die to sin and are raised to new life in Christ, where we're named and claimed and gifted and sent to share the good news and set free at the table to drink the cup, drink the cup of life that was given by Jesus through his death, the cup of forgiveness, the cup of mercy, the cup of grace that is poured out for us. And all of this, all of this at a God's table of grace set before us where there are not only two chairs there, but instead a feasting table that goes on and on and grows and grows where all are welcome, all are welcome so that everybody has a place of honor at God's table, everyone, 
There is a place at God's table for every one, every one of God's beloved. So let's continue. Let's continue to invite. Let's continue to love because God first loved us. And let's make sure that everybody knows that the feasting table is there for them, is ready, is welcome, so that everybody can have a place in God's love, in God's life, for the whole world. The Spirit continues to send us forth so that we might share Jesus' love in the world. Amen.
for the church, the world, and all in need. Holy One, for the gift of the church handed down through the ages, and for all who carry on the servant ministry of Jesus, we praise you. Send your Holy Spirit upon all who are discerning calls to ministries in its many forms, and equip them with your gifts. We pray especially for our bishops, Elizabeth Eaton and Amy Current. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creating one for the lush and abundant habitat you provide for all your creatures, we praise you. Provide for waterfowl, reptiles, wild horses, dolphins, and all living things so that they flourish as you intend. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Suffering one for all who work towards peace and who lead nations with a servant's heart, we praise you. Bring justice for all who suffer violence, persecution, discrimination, hunger, poverty, and homelessness, and create places of refuge for all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful one for all who do the work of healing in mind, body, and spirit. We praise you. Surround and comfort all who struggle with depression, anxiety, cancer, diabetes, dementia, or any illness, especially Dave, Lynn Sainson, Kathy Iam, Debbie, Pastor Dell, Deb, Sharon, Claudia, Tim, Karen, Baby Windsor, Agnes, Linda and Bob Holtz, Cashton, the family of Agnes Jensen, and the family of baby Everett Sheffield. And those that we name now out loud are in the silence of our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sustaining one for all who share their gifts of time and treasures through the vitality of this congregation, we praise you. Teach us to set our hearts on you and to use our power responsibly, especially for those who are oppressed, neglected, and in need. Bless those celebrating birthdays this week, especially Carol Rathjen, Ann Hatcher, Brent Herman, and Steve Johnson. We thank you for the gift of marriage, and we lift to you David and Julie Krauss as they celebrate their wedding anniversary. Lord, in your mercy. Risen One, we thank you for those who have shaped your church and shared your gospel. Through the witness of your saints, especially Everett Sheffield, continue to inspire us with hope until we all are gathered at your eternal feast. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Receive these prayers, O God, and those in our hearts known only to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you for your gifts and your offerings. There's an offering plate on the back table, and thank you for those who faithfully give electronically. Let us pray. God of abundance, you cause streams to break forth in the desert and manna to rain from the heavens. Accept the gifts you have first given us. Unite them with the offerings of our lives to nourish the world you love so dearly. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able for the Lord's will. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right our duty and joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, he gave thanks, and he gave it to all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant and my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All who hunger and thirst come. The table is ready. You may be seated. <laughs>
body of Christ in you. The body of Christ in you. The body of Christ in you. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. <clears throat> Lord of life, in the gift of your body and blood, you turn the crumbs of our faith into a feast of salvation. Send us forth into the world with shouts of joy, bearing witness to the abundance of your love in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. And as we go from this place to be servants out in the world, receive this blessing, which comes from our taking faith home and inserts. May the Lord rescue you from trouble and give you a servant's heart through our Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our sending song is number 547.